All right. Here's where that culvert pipe comes in from across the road onto this property. And then there's an additional slope in from here. The rest of this slope feeds into this trough that bottoms out, the key line is right there on the property line. And uh, at some point, the neighbor and I will probably put a pond in with the dam just this side of that pecan tree over there, which is right on his side of the line. But this swale on contour comes all the way from that large mesquite tree near the property line over here <clears throat> into this pond. And this is how I have it so far drawn up. And this is a short, right there's the dam. Right there is sort of a bottoming out spot. And then there's another slope and it goes to another key line a little, or bottoming out spot right there in the choke point further down for a second pond. And this is the only place on this part of the property, according to the neighbor and generally accepted lore, that uh, you can pond any water in without putting some kind of liner in it. Uh, I know that people like Sepp Holzer, like he says he can put a pond anywhere. And that may be true, but I can dig out a lot right here and be rocks and reeds up front. And then this is deep, two deep ponds with swales. The next swale goes around that way, but I've already got it lined out here. We did this with a A-frame. And then this is a big clump of trees that are just covered with wild grapes. Up here is uh, post oaks and live oaks and uh, red oaks, mesquites, lots of mesquites, some cedar, uh, and a few other trees. Some, uh, oh, I forget what you call those. Anyway, well, we call them trash trees, but I don't think they're trash trees. Along here, and along these swales, I want pecans and chestnuts as the uh, and oaks as the primary trees and hickories and ash and as the leguminous trees I want uh, honey mesquite honey locust um, I can put in uh, blue bonnets which is the state flower is also a leguminous ground cover and uh, and they're beautiful and black-eyed peas uh, and Texas mountain laurel which has a real showy flower and smells like grape kool-aid uh, those under there and I want persimmons all along these swales and hazelnuts as an understory and we can use the uh, Hazelnuts, you can coppice them. You can use them for food and fuel and feed. Uh, I could drill a well if I had the money. And one of the questions you're supposed to ask the client is whether they have more time than money or more money and less time. And this property definitely falls under the more time, less money. I will be dead before this is done. And I'm 50 now. <clears throat> I would do something with the drive. See these big chunks that came out of it in the rain. And I will repair that. But that's the first time in 30 years. And I don't know if uh, this is the only part of the drive, really, that there's any gravel or road base on. And I don't know that once in 30 years is enough to worry about. I can shovel up that much road base that flowed into that low spot there where the pond is going to be and dump it right there with a wheelbarrow. So I, I, in the plan, I leave this exactly the way it is. And at certain stretches, it's more or less level and then follows the slope of the land down. <clears throat> and if this held water down here, then I could design in a pond 
and just keep building the road up depending on how big I wanted the pond to be. It could it could hook back in between those mesquite trees where that natural swale is in that third paddock over there. The land slopes again over along the property line. That low sort of trench, which used to be a trench uh, 50 or more years ago that they filled in, comes over onto this side of the property line and goes down my side all the way to the river acre from that point on. And if it held water, it's a great place for a series of uh, a series of small impoundments or one long one. I had convinced myself that I could put a series of ponds here with even a big one down where the road meets the levee if I was confident that it would hold because, of course, their house and stables are just on the other side of that. But And then from that, create more or less a canal down the property line to where the drive comes in from the back road to operate as a fire break as a uh, and also as a continuous water source for a series of paddocks through where that area between this levee here and the house where I have all those trees planted between that property line and where the driveway curves around that is a series of paddocks still in the design but I've got to put swales into it but I would still wouldn't mind having a water source or a walla um, because one of my plans really would be to raise mule foot hogs on pasture, rotational pasture on some of the farm. Uh, they're a heritage breed. They're highly marketable. They're also just really good pork apparently. And they're interesting and it suits me and some dorper sheep because they're good hot weather sheep they're a south african sheep they're a meat sheep they shed their uh their wool they're a hair sheep and uh and they're acclimated to this area in fact there is a guy north of here who raises them who i could perhaps they'll get some from and he said that there's a man from whole foods who comes around and buys them direct so there'd be a market for excess stock on that if i had that big of a flock <clears throat> i don't know what i can support on 15 acres but i know if i manage grazing in a rotational way and if i keep enough pasture on the ground that i can run more than my neighbors who just turn them loose and that it'll improve the soil as it goes if I do it right. <clears throat> but that's all I know is what's possible, I think. Here's more wild grapes down here. They're all over a clump of trees there. They're all over that clump of trees there. They make great wine and they make great jelly. They're pretty astringent, they make you pucker. tractor broke down and the farm called my bluff on my uh, scythe because I have not cut anything with a scythe and now that it's <coughs> about a hundred degrees Fahrenheit here now I'm not going to cut anything with a scythe but this paddock right this paddock right here is essentially intact and it's about an acre maybe a little more uh, long narrow and there is a kind of a swale in the middle of it between these two mesquite trees it's all overgrown with Johnson grass right now there's two desert willows there's a Tananashi persimmon over there a cedar elm there is a pear tree very few fruit trees left after the fire three years ago But there's a lot of pecans, there's oaks. <clears throat> this would be a production garden or just another paddock with more trees on swales. But in my design, I think it's a production garden for a CSA to uh, 
sale baskets on subscription. Otis! Used to have donkeys in that paddock. They were friends of Otis's. This was the middle paddock, which was smaller than the third and the first. There's a path down here that I had planted with elderberry, and there's a pomegranate, and there's a row of blackberries there, and planted some chestnuts here that didn't all make it. There's just one, I think, over here that made it. Uh, but this is where I was going to start planting fruit and nut trees thick and heavy with swales on contour such that there is but before I plant anything I want to mark out the rest of the swales here <laughs> 